Lounge and Sun. All right, welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name's Ryan, and back with me again, I have one of my favorite people on the planet. I have Sarah Frazetta, and um, not only that, but I have my wife joining me. We're going to go through <laughs> the fantastic worlds of Frank Frazetta, the new book from Toshin, which is, I, I'm not even, it's not even just my opinion. I think it's the best Frazetta book that's ever been published. Um, I'm super stoked to be able to go with you go through it with you today, Sarah. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you so much for doing this. We we finally got our copies and it's it's so exciting. <laughs> I know, I know. And I, I remember when I asked you if you had yours yet and you couldn't believe I had mine. And I, I ordered mine through the comic book store that I work at. So I was kind of shocked that I was getting it before people that even ordered directly from Toshin. Yeah, I'm oh. still waiting on all of my comps right now. So anyone I own comps to, you will get yours hopefully this week. Um, there was just a little, you know, there's always some kind of logistical problem, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the fans have them first and that they, you, you deserve it more than, more than, more than I do. Well, I mean, I think you deserve a lot, a lot too. I mean, all the work that you do, like we've talked about this, we've talked a couple, few times, um, on the channel about like what you do to like keep your grandfather's legacy alive. And I think it's awesome. And this is just another product of that. So, um, I'm going to flip well, and open oh. the book. I was going to say, before we get into that, can I just show you really quickly yeah, the deluxe version? I did I did get this. This, this was well worth the wait. Wow. So yeah. this is the collector's edition. There were only 1,000 copies printed. And oh, it, it, you got to have really strong shoulders to, to handle this bad boy. It's 11 pounds. Um, and so this is wrapped in leather. And it actually has a metal cover. So this is a different a cover than the, the regular edition. This is the famous funnies and this is metal. Yeah. So really cool. And it's I vegan leather purple. too, you said, right? It is vegan leather. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't know. I, I, a lot of the comments were right, Frank Frazetta would have wanted real leather, and they're they're probably right. But Tashin does vegan leather, so we have vegan leather. And according to Tashin, this leather will hold the, stand the test of time, so it's very good quality. And honestly, when I have it in my hand, you you can't really tell the difference. Yeah. So uh, I know we talked about it uh, last time we talked when we, before the book was actually released. But for anybody that hasn't seen that or like they're watching this video first, can you talk a little bit about like the genesis of like how this project came about? Did Tashin reach out to you directly? Like, how did that all happen? Yes. So Tashin made contact with us back in, I believe it was 2018 or so. And it was single-handedly Diane Hansen, who's the editor of the book, who wanted to bring Frazetta to Tashin. So we have to thank Diane for having such a passion. Um, Diane's done an incredible um, amount of work for Tashin. And she just had a very strong love for Frazetta and thought that the book would do really well. And she was right. Yeah, I mean it's it's something to behold. I when I saw it at the shop, I think a customer had come in and they're like they asked me what it was because like they could see the box that it came in, you know, the brown one. Yeah. And um, yep. they're like, "Can you flip through it?" I'm like, like I didn't really want to open it there. I kind of wanted yeah, to open no. it at home, but I'm like, whatever. You know, it was a, it was a regular, so I kind of like showed them a little bit. I'm like, all right, that's it. It's going back. I'm not I'm not trying to ruin this before I've had well, a chance yeah. to really enjoy it. Well, we get protective over the copies. I, we have a copy in the museum here, and um, sometimes I'll, I'll I'll ask whoever's looking through it. I'm like, you really like that book, huh? Because they're just like they keep going through it over and over and over again. I see the fingerprints going on it, and it's just it's a piece of art in itself. So, yeah. understandably, why you were like, yeah, I kind of want to go through it myself. Don't touch. Yeah, my book. I mean, just even from <laughs> fingers this, off from the opening, you know, like to see the different types of paper that he was working on. Because I remember you said that that he would draw on anything. Yes. He was a very frugal man and he didn't have a ton of art supplies lying around. So it was, it was never about the tools he used or the paper he used. It was, he would say, it's just my, it's my talent. It's my raw gift that I've worked on. And it doesn't, you don't have to have the best paper you can work on anything. And how much of this was like directly from the estate that they were pulling and how much of this was, because I mean, obviously like I could see like, some of the comic book pages probably I, I'm sure was were sold in auctions or stuff. Um, but like some of the stuff that were in here, like like no, notebook paper and stuff like that, or like little pieces of brown scrap paper that I saw in here. Yeah, I mean, it was a collaborative effort. So a lot of, like you said, a lot of the earlier works had been sold off. I mean, my grandfather would hold on to 
artworks that were really near and dear to his heart. Um, but overall, they most of them are in private collections. So it was really like the help of heritage auctions. Um, we got with other, Diane had gotten with other collectors and we were, it was a collaborative effort to get the scans and a lot of those early works. So right now what you're flipping through, that was a collaboration with Al Williamson. Um, okay. And I think it was pretty cool that they 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 separated those panels, and then there's the the full panel uh, deeper into the book of of the full of all of the um, the panels that were worked on between Al Williamson and Frazetta. But it was really Benedict Taschen who kind of stepped in in the middle of the process, and he told Diane that he wanted to emphasize more of Frazetta's comic years. So that's why you do see so much of the book dedicated to the early works because that just hadn't been done before. Um, and I mean, I agree with Benedict and there was there were some pieces that were left out that I wish had been, had been included, but for the sake of what Benedict had in mind, it worked out well because a lot of people, a lot of fans haven't been able to really see these pieces blown up and see the details of the line and the masterful inking that went into it. Oh, I know, like just here, like you can see where the strokes of the brush is in the ink in the quill. You can see the 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 tone paper that they put over, the, over here, the lines from the lettering. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just insane. And for me, like, and it mentions it in the book later, like with the the comic books, like not everybody even associates Frazetta with comics, you know, especially right. so much exactly. of that started before all the paintings like really took off. I mean, I love this. Absolutely. Movie. No, I love the Yeah, that's movie. that's one of my favorite pieces. I mean, those that, that pop of blue in the left-hand corner. Oh my God. That one's, that one's, in the watercolor in this corner it's so, like is this was this an all this not an all watercolor piece though like this is mixed oil. media right yeah make, make a lot of the, some of the times he would use gouache and oil um mm -hmm. and then of course i mean he do, did whatever he wanted but most yeah. most of it was oil at this time um but yeah little little tiny bits of watercolor as well that piece that original i've seen that original quite a few times in person oh my god it's just i'm i'm really glad that Diane picked that piece it it deserves to have the cover and and the in, insert. Yeah, it's it's an amazing it really piece, it, and it's away. iconic. It you know, away. it's so it's so iconic. iconic. Another iconic piece. Yes, another yep. one of my favorites. And I love how like I love how they. Do, I'll just mention this real quick, but like the way they divided the book up. You know, the anthropomorphic animals and little Abner. You know, Tarzan, Conan, Ringo Starr, Esquire, Death Dealer, Fire and Ice, and then you really get like those snapshots of those specific decades, which obviously like the sixties and seventies were very prevalent for him, as well as the fifties. Right. Um, and then into the fire and ice era and stuff and towards the end uh, this is that cover you were talking about which is the cover that you have yes yes yeah I just I love how she designed it I love the pages like the, like again the choice of the color the purple it really it, it matches the artwork well and there was just so much thought that went into this and that's why I love working with Tashin because there are books are works of art and that's what Frazetta deserves like you know it just it has to be this way. It has to be designed with intention. Yeah, I mean the quotes, even Ralph. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here, Ralph like... Bakshi's quote. That's my, that's my favorite quote in the book. Ralph yeah. Bakshi's. I'll read it for anybody that hasn't seen it, just so they so they know. Uh, when he was young, he was young for a very long time. He ran with the wind, danced between raindrops to stay dry, hit baseballs so far that he laughed at their disappearance. And when he drew, the Italian Renaissance lived in his hands. He painted in smoke so soft it looked like real light, not paint. I mean, that's probably one of the best quotes you, I've ever read. Ever. And I mean, if me, he was maybe buttering up my grandpa a bit. Then he was, I know my grandpa would have loved that. He'd be like, okay, Ralph, come over and hang out today. I, I love you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's got, uh, that's a way with words, man. You know, like, the, very oh, descriptive in it, you know, and um, something like, I could not have even thought of in a way to describe somebody's work, you know, I mean, just amazing. No, um, no, that's, that's really hard to do. And now, now I know Ralph is actually a poet deep down. It's beautiful. Yeah, he's been hiding it all these years. Yeah. Um, so I love the fact that like we get the snapshots throughout Frazetta's life in here. The intro I really dug. I loved uh, this this little note that I wanted to mention too is like because his life could have gone very differently based on this one event when he was fourteen with his teacher, right? To, uh, you know, an Italian neoclassical painter who was a sole proprietor of a single floor all ages school. It was a Brooklyn Academy of Fine Arts in Brooklyn, and he taught drawing and painting rooted in the 19th century Roman neoclassical movement. And that's where Frazetta learned brush control for subtle gradients, washes, and thin taut lines. And 
he was planning to send him to Rome to further his education, but died just before his 14th birthday. Like how that could have given us a completely different Frank Frazetta, like that pivotal yeah. moment in his life, you know, like that really stood out to me. It's it's huge. And I mean, that, that moment stands out to me. I, I talk about it here in the museum all the time because it it's, I think it, it really affected his whole career um, with, with what Michelle Falange, of, of course, what he wanted to do, his intentions with him was with training him and bringing him to Italy, but really his words. So if Michelle was always very against my grandfather getting into comics and illustration. And the reason being was he said, you know, Frazetta, your, your quality is it's, it's superb. And I can see you as a, a fine artist and that's what you need to do. Um, don't go into comics and illustration because you won't be respected. And, you know, obviously that's changing now, but for a long time he struggled with that. And um, it was, it was two weeks before um, he, he planned to go that Michelle Falange passed away. And that is what catapulted my grandpa then back in the comics um and yeah he would have been a, a who knows what he could have been but definitely he would have been he would have gone into the fine arts and I, I don't know what he, his his subject matter would have been I can I can theorize and say probably like more wildlife um and just like classical compositions like with women um but yeah it's it's interesting where where what happens in our life and how it but I, I'm glad that he became the fantasy. So am I. So am I. I, yeah, I, don't, want it to get, I don't want it to get twisted by anybody listening and watching this because yeah. like I love like the fantasy genre would be a very different thing without him. Very exactly. different. Exactly. I mean, I'm sorry that, that, that teacher died. It's sad, but like look yeah. what we, we got from that, you know, and like seeing some of his influences that I wasn't even aware of, like just the mention of the Fantasia. And night on the bald mountain sequence. Like I didn't know some of these things before. So like just seeing that was super, super awesome. And like Ryan, we we watched Fantasia. Like I'm not even kidding. Like ho- at least hundreds, if not a thousand times together. Like that what movie was such a huge influence on him that it cannot be overstated. It's incredible. I mean, I have a couple pieces here just in this museum. Um, he did a uh Schernabog the night of, of, of Fantasia, the last sequence, it's night on Bald Mountain. He did a little watercolor study of that and was hoping to do an oil painting. And then he did a re, the, his Reassembled Man, which is in the book. Actually, the Chernobog, um, uh preliminary is in the book as well. It's the first time it's ever been published. But not so he did pieces that were directly inspired from it. But then a lot of the pieces that he did just in general were subconsciously inspired by him as, as well. There's his Milton Kniff phase right there. Yeah, I, I just it. love it. And yeah. he's only, it's 18 when he does this page. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just insane to see that kind of talent at such a young age, you know, like in just his uh his line work, his anatomy. That's like the thing that's always stood out to me. I think I've told you that before. Like the way he draws a human figure, insane that you can like see the muscles. And there's a page in here I saw where he was doing the study of, of somebody who was in a notebook and he drew all of the muscles underneath like uh, without the skin on like it was just insane <laughs> so, yeah, yeah yeah he had a pretty good grasp on it so that that white right there weird science fantasy number um 29 mm-hmm. that wasn't originally and i'm sure it says that all in on that page yeah. but that was um originally for buck rogers and then buck rogers said it was too violent yeah. so then he went over to bill gaines and bill gaines was like all right he's like i'll publish this we'll change it a little bit so it's not B- buck rogers anymore um, but he said, he said he wanted to keep the original as Bill Gaines typically did. And my grandfather loved that piece so much. Like he couldn't, he could, first of all, he couldn't believe that they denied it for Buck Rogers. He's like, what are they insane? And they were like, I mean, how, how could you pass up that piece? Um, and he knew that it was his top piece. So he brought it over to Bill Gaines and Bill Gaines tried to keep the piece business as usual. And my grandpa said, I'm going to keep the original and you can cut my pay in half. So that ended up happening. My grandpa held on to that original Um, I believe until he passed away, that was in his collection. And um, yeah, so that was his top, that was his favorite piece that he ever did. Um, Dare I say he loved that more than even Cat Girl and Death Dealer One, which were the two paintings he always said were his his favorite in the collection. I believe that piece passed them. Yeah, Um, that's amazing. I mean, there's so much life in this piece, the movement and like even so much like just the boot that he's wearing in the folds. It's, it's insane. Beautiful. Like I, yeah. I, I can't even. I just say it's insane because I. It's, it's so good. It's like otherworldly that piece. Yeah. 
and I and I loved it in this part here. I mean, obviously, I already knew this before I read it here, but just like how he really puts himself, you know, like the the character with the jeans and the t shirt, you know, like that's yeah, that's yeah. Him and all this stuff. And I loved it, like what he said, like he's very physical minded, brain fine, but this body is put here for use. If anybody could jump around like my heroes, it's me. I love I love <laughs> that line. It's true. And like, we've been talking about that a lot in the last month and here in the museum, just about how my grandpa was as a human being. I mean, there's no right way to do art. And a lot of the times, you know, you, you, you want to put it in a box and say, you must go to art school. You must dedicate this many hours a day to art. And, you know, they're, 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 they try to put this, the society tries to put the structure on everything. And my grandpa, I feel like, and this is theoretical, but I do feel like when he was out experiencing life, using his physicality, sports, using his body, that was all part of his art. He wasn't doing art, like, again, consciously, like, out uh, out exploring or taking in animals or physicality, but that was just part of his process and how he got to the end goal. Um, so it's just interesting. Everyone has their has their own way of getting to that final product, and his just happened to be playing and and you know, doing his, his, whatever he did, which was usually athletic. Yeah. Oh, I know. I love seeing those old photographs of him or the reference photos that he had. Like, I know he's your grandma's reference a lot. You know I mean? That, that was evident in a lot of his pieces as well. Um, yeah. He used her, he used her like, I mean, he, he, she was definitely an inspiration. Like that she was the main muse, but mm -hmm. I mean, he would pull a lot from just like women in Hollywood that he thought was just be, they were beautiful. Um, so he had a lot of muses over the years. That squeeze play, that, that is a, he had a lot of reference shots for that one. And of course they were all himself. Yeah. Like right there. I mean, that's yeah. even yeah. with the cigarette in the mouth. I mean, yeah, I can't, right. <laughs> there's so many pictures of him with that, you know, this one is, I found interesting too. Like this is uh, the girl he was dating before. Yes. Carol. Name. That was her name. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, she was Greek. She was a ballet dancer and um, he was madly in love with her. And I believe that her, her parents told him, um, her that she couldn't date him anymore. And he was just devastated. And then I don't want to say my grandmother was a, a rebound, but it, she was close soon after uh, Carol. I mean, you know, everything happens for a reason. He was meant to be with somebody else. And that's why it happened that way. Yeah, exactly. And his golden girl. Too, that's right Yeah. That. This was one of the first pieces that ever inspired me. I think I, I just love the way that he does animals, their faces, the bone structure. It just really always stood out to me. And actually, like um, his animals are what pulled me into him in the first place, his style. That's beautiful. I, I it's, wish it's, you're right about that. With with his animals, like they the eyeballs like have a soul. They really yes. do. Like it's there's there's something like you can have all of this technique and 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 just training, but if you can't put like an energy into it, it you can tell it's like a yes. it's just something from your soul that transmits to it. Yeah, the temptress. Yeah, I love this one too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Her face, yeah. Just her facial expressions. Yeah. So the fifty-one means he did it in fifty-one, right? Seventy-nine is the when they made the print, or when yeah, it got so they would. Yeah, they copyrighted it later on. But the, the, it was the same thing with the Golden Girl. The Golden Girl has, I think, 1970 as well. And that was also done in the early 50s. It's just crazy to have that talent so young and have developed such a like a craft at such a young age, you know, because like he was, I don't, 28 was when he was born, right? So he was 23, yep. 23 when yep. he did this. Like that's, 23. that's it's insane. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I love the mention here. I just wanted like to shout it out is because like it talks about Frazetta fans, Sylvester Stallone, George Lucas, Clint Eastwood came calling, you know, and. And then the Death Dealer album cover in 78 and Frazetta became a brand, you know, you know, like, like that in and of itself, because you don't have, you don't say Frank Frazetta, you just say Frazetta, you know, like, right, right. And it's just, it's Which crazy is, it's to so see like cool. where that kind of started, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, it is to think about how many pieces in his collection are iconic like they're just known pieces and not many artists can say that there's usually like one or two that they're really known for but he has so many that he's known for which is just it's a, it's a mind it's mind-blowing yeah he just had a lot I think it just again it was about like the fact that he didn't just sit there and try to work it out when it wasn't someone something wasn't inspiring him he just he took action when he needed to um in the moment and you know some of the pieces some of the pieces aren't 
I, I, I would argue as iconic because those were pieces that were just like, I have to do this job. I'm not really into it. But when his heart was into it, those were the, those are mo like most of them, people remember him forever. Yeah, definitely. I love how this, I mean, I don't know what language is. It's in German and there's another language too, right? That this German and French and English. Okay. Don't skip the pages if you buy this book because you're missing art. Just FYI. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because the reading is not in English. The the type up here where it's describing what you're seeing is. And I love how like, you know, post EC with the whole Frederick Wortham shit that went down where like mm -hmm. Thomas Code Authority, you know, like him jumping into Erie and Creepy because I know EC, he was huge with them and getting to see some of these things that I've I, like a lot of this I have never seen before. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's great, Ryan. Like, like, awesome. I, like I told you, oh. like, I'm really taking my time. Like, I look at a little bit at a time. I didn't want to, like, skim through it. I mean, I did when I first opened it. I kind of just, like, I wanted to see what it was all about. But from there, like, I just wanted to take my time, you know, because I love so much seeing the different mediums that he works in. And he's a master at every single one, whether it's oil or watercolor, pen and ink, pencil. I mean, just this one alone, you know, and, like, I love that you even get that little splotch of, like, I'm assuming it was a drink unless it was ink in this bottom right corner. You Most know, of the time there were little coffee stains. Um, okay, it was it, coffee. That's what I thought. Sloppy. Yeah. Yeah, he actually didn't start. Um, I think I might have told you this before, Ryan, but I, I he didn't start using oils until he was in his 30s. Oh, wow. And Vampirella. he picked them up real quick. Yeah, Vampirella. So the story of Vampirella, have you mm. heard that? How he, he got the original art back from, um, from Warren and he took the costume off and then they sold it with a, a nude Vampirella. He didn't like the costume. He didn't design the costume. Some people think he designed the costume. It was Trina Robbins. Um, and he just thought it was hokey and wanted her nude. So then he completely devalued the original artwork by taking her costume off. I'm like, oh, grandpa. Oh, I didn't know Trina <laughs> anyway. Robbins. I, I know Trina Robbins. I didn't know she designed this costume. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I like the costume, you know, Trina. Just say Yeah, I mean, I think it's iconic, <laughs> you know, like the yeah, character herself. This is another, this is, this is where I started like noticing too, because this is more of the paintings where you can see the texture in them. Like the reproduction on this is insane. It's insane. That how one's it's great. Coming through. Yeah. I saw that one. It, it's perfect. That's, that's a perfect reproduction because I actually just saw that original at the Norman Rockwell museum two summers ago. And it's pretty damn great. It's perfect. This piece right here, this one right here. This is where you see the canvas. This yeah. is this is what this is what grabbed me too when I could see because you can see the line like what he's drawing underneath, and then the layers of paint, and then you can see where obviously it's he's not using as much paint. He didn't paint as much over the canvas, and then mm -hmm. you can see up here where he obviously the layers are a little bit thicker. That's why you're not seeing the canvas shine through. Yeah, that piece that piece he talked about in depth, um, just how he thought that was his most one of his most masterful comp compositions he ever designed, mm -hmm. because he said like he, he was like I I can't believe like the how I I really knocked it out of the park with the shapes. He would hold it upside down, turn it side to side, and he was like it's perfect in every direction you hold it. It's perfect. Telling you, we would have been robbed of so much good stuff if he didn't do the fantasy stuff. Love this this one I've never seen before. I've never seen that one. Well, think about like Conan, like where would that I know. be now if, if Frazetta went into just fine art? I mean, the like, first image that comes into my mind when I think of Conan is a Frazetta piece, you know, yeah, like yeah. that's all I think of. Well, yeah, it was Barry Windsor Smith before, which I think I love Barry Windsor Smith's art, but it was just, uh, you know, he had a more of like a hawkish look. He was thinner. Mm -hmm. And then and then it wasn't much of like, oh, oh this like monster looking barbarian. And my grandpa, funny enough, he never read any of the Robert E. Howard stories. It was actually just Roy Crankle who gave him the excerpts and said, Frank, like, this is what I think you need to read. This is what you need to know about who Conan is. So when my grandpa interpreted the small amount of words from Robert E. Howard, he goes, this isn't, no again, no offense to Barry Windsor Smith, but he's like, this isn't how he should look. So he took upon himself to make this like mean looking barbarian that had the scars and he was just like jacked and and then it became the perfect pairing and that's why conan just i mean sold millions of paperbacks yeah i never thought conan should be thin i and again no, no. shade at barry windsor smith but he was yeah. he was too lean you know like if he's a warrior he's yeah. a barbarian like he's gotta be yoked he's gotta be big he, he's gotta be he's gotta have scars battle wounds like why yeah. you know it's like what are we doing? So that was my grandpa's <laughs> viewpoint. He's like, well, what are we doing? I, I need to make him like this, the cool guy. So yeah. Oh, this, this one sort of Mars. 
The, yeah. Oh, Hamali Hatchet, Dark Kingdom. We have that in the museum. I'm looking at it right now. Ugh. And yeah, I, I mean, at this one, and like, I'm like, oh, I wish I could draw that. I would attempt, but don't come close to it. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, that's that's definitely up there with the with the top masterpieces. Um, it's funny because it's like that's Kane. It's on the cover of Carl Edward Wagner's Dark Crusade, but it was just it became so iconic because of Molly Hatchet. Like, just like Death Dealer 1. I mean, Molly Hatchet and everyone's like, okay, if they don't know Frazetta, they're like, oh, Molly Hatchet, that artist. And so that's, that's always, always Molly Hatchet. Thank you, Molly Hatchet. All right, this is what I had to, I stopped this one. This touches Bond to the comics that's coming out now. I love that there's a Mothman book coming out. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like pounding things. I love the Mothman story. Um, I just, I read the script a few weeks ago and it's really, really fun. So I'm excited for that to come out. It's kind of like a mix of like True Blood and Deadpool. And it's, oh, it's nice. you know, with Frazetta, with Frazetta, I want, we, we're going in a different direction with that dealer, um, but eventually. But Mothman, I felt like that was like a perfect tone. And my grandpa did have like, you know, you, you want this like Tolkien um dark night tone with a lot of his artworks but then with mothman he's just like this like weirdo that you know it's mothman <laughs> so there's a lot you can do with it and my grandpa because he did have that like quirky eccentric side we can we can kind of play off that a bit with mothman in particular yeah i and it was on the cover of high times yeah it's so weird like i i seen this piece but I, I mean i didn't know where i saw it and i definitely did not see a high times logo on it yeah, that actually is in the collection. I believe that that beautiful scan was thanks to George Lucas. He oh, will wow. have that in the narrative art museum that he opens. I believe now it's slated for 2025. Wow. And I can't wait to see that original. I haven't I don't I don't think I've ever seen that original. I think he owned it way before I was even or right when I was probably born, he he bought it. Yeah, that Star Wars money, that's why money to yeah. throw around. You know? Yeah, yeah. No. Well, no. actually, one of George, George Lucas got, I can't remember the name right now. It's a lesser known piece, but it's a it's a space themed piece. And my grandparents were selling it back in the 70s. And it's in a catalog. And they sold it to Lucas for $800. And it's an oil. And I'm like, ah, $800. Oh, that's painful. <laughs> Which, yeah, I know it is painful. Man, crazy. Terrible. Yeah, I, I got to get out to the museum you're sitting in right now before I go to yes. the Lucas Museum. That's my goal. Yes, you have to come visit us. We'll host you. Host you Another both. Piece. I'd never seen this one before. Oh yeah, the galleon. The galleon, yeah. This I one's awesome. I believe that was so oh, gosh, I'm gonna mess it up, but I think it was um Wyatt um that that he pulled that from. Okay. Or Pyle. It was Howard Pyle. There it came. Whew. Amazing. I love when the when the light switches on in my brain. I'm like, there it is. <laughs> and then oh, it's Requiem for a shark. I'm yeah, the I, lighting I on like her backside because yeah. you know is insane the reflection that yeah. he did it's a just... lot of the, so i i didn't really love that revision um the the first version was like i, I just loved the, the first version but it did seem anytime that he would revise it it was just he really wanted to get the emphasis on the butt and the lighting on the butt so it was all for the beautiful shape of the woman's buttocks that is what drove him for to many I mean, he said to it revive earlier the many book, that, I didn't want to. I don't want to like spend a lot of time talking about it. But he talks about what he prefers on the female body. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, shapes. They're interesting shapes. Yeah. <laughs> Penthouse Comics cover. This one is another one I really dig. Yeah, Queen Kong. She's cool. She. Um. I. I, I like that one. And it's again. It just goes back to his other huge influence, other than Fantasia, which was the nineteen thirty three King Kong. Like that was that film was just. Mm. He was obsessed. He was obsessed with it. I, and when I say obsessed, I truly mean that. Oh, this is what the, I, this is what I, I did because of the fact that uh, like you said, like not a lot of people know about the comic side. That's what I. But we already talked about that. That's why I kind of highlighted that. I like that they they make mention of it. Yeah, his, his Thunder was his first, um, his first comic. So he he developed that and and did it from cover to cover, all the interior work, the cover, um, and you know obviously that was a rip off of Tarzan, like pretty right. <laughs> it's pretty clear, pretty clear. Mm -hmm. So it's describing Frazetta here, athletic, handsome, mischievous, marred only by a scar allegedly resulting from a shotgun blast of rock salt after he pulled a prank. Is that about him? Or did I read that wrong? 
I I'm gonna have to read that part again. Okay, because it you says can then recon, reconfirm. Yeah, because it does. I'm I'm assuming it says the young Frazetta didn't look or act like a comic book artist. Okay. I was a loner, and I knew that if I didn't stand up for myself, I'd have nothing but trouble. So one day I threw a rock at the leader of this gang of punks, and he came swaggering over and said, "Did you yeah. hit me with that rock?" I said, "Yeah." What are you gonna do about it? And just as he was starting to tell me, I was on and bam, like that. So yeah, just that little anecdote of him like picking a fight with somebody. I mean, that was true. He had to. He grew up in a tough neighborhood, yeah. and that is what that that's what gave him his thick skin. He had like a bunch of bullies. It was a different time, so I'm like, how are these like gangs walking around the street? But yeah, he said they were like gang members, and he'd have to fight for his his place as as the tough guy in the neighborhood because he's just this like scrawny kid. So I think that's really what I mean that motivated him to get in shape and be athletic because he didn't want his ass kicked. So different times i don't know i'm like how? yeah yeah i also <laughs> I, got, like, I, got I got bullied like with words so i, I can't understand that <laughs> yeah i mean i definitely wasn't fighting when i was when i was young i wasn't going up to somebody like hey you know talking shit and trying to pick a fight with them by any means no, um, no. i love the story of how you met your grandma too and how your grandma she's just like oh. a firecracker man how she just like went up to him and called him out because she heard that, or saw <laughs> that he was talking about her yeah, she so he was watching her um in the, the in the roller rink for like weeks and he remembered her little like on her little skirt that she had on and she had I guess like these like purple panties that because she's like a you know skating and um so when she'd skate around like her little you know skirt would fly up and he was noticing and um so they so she saw her again it was at nathan's hot dogs on coney island and they were she was in line and he was with a buddy and he was in whispering and looking at her and she noticed she's like that was like the love at first sight story she turned around and she's like oh he's hot like wow who is who is this and <laughs> and then he and then she goes what are you talking about me and he goes, he goes, yeah, I'm talking about you. Are you the girl from the roller rink with the purple panties? And she blushed and she was like, oh my God. And like, you know, just like those, like that, like butterfly kind of love. She said that um, he would come to the house and he'd like throw rocks at her window at night. And, and, and her, and her dad was there and then her dad would be like, who's out there. And, and she just said like any interaction she had at first, like she just couldn't sleep after like, that's how excited their love made her which i'm like that's i mean of course there was a lot of toxic moments too because that's usually when you have that much passion you get the other end of the stick as well unfortunately that's life yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense <laughs> i get yeah. it. It, it there's a price to pay with everything yep so this is that page i was talking about that i had mentioned where he's studying the anatomy and he's like all the muscles the bone structure and everything it just it absolutely blew me away and getting to see that that's a picture of one of his notebooks, I thought was really awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad they put that in there. And then the snowman, the original, um, that was his that was his first published work. Um, he did that when he was 16 years old. I mean, he, he worked on snowman when he was much younger. But then when he went to Bernard Bailey's, um, there was a gentleman named John Gunta. And John Gunta was the head of the art department. And he's, he noticed my grandpa was doing all these little flip books. And mm -hmm. he was like, what are you working on? Because, you know, when he's a kid working at the comic house, he's he's erasing lines. And that's where he should be because he's a kid. But he's erasing lines and then working on this, like, these little panels on the side. And and Snowman was one of them. And um, so so Gunta liked it so much. He was like, let's work on something together and get it published. So his first published work was that work when he was 16 years old. This one, too. Look at this. Dude. This Insane. Yeah, was I don't it? recall ever seeing that piece before that it was in, before it was in the book. I mean, this is this is why I think I I, well, I don't think I, I said this is the best Frazetta book that I think has ever been published. Not only is the quality there, the reproduction value is really high, and the book itself is just like flashy. It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's and it's like, so big, like you yeah. get to really examine the art, which you don't get to do in some of the smaller. I mean, I, I'll buy anything. It's true, people, but you know, you yeah. don't get to see it as as well as you can with this you know yeah this is a monograph it's just it's it's a it's a huge it's a real coffee table book and you have to have a sturdy coffee table because it's a heavy one it's yeah, I'm, a big on, boy. I'm on my dining room table it's the only place i could I yeah could that's a, why my kitchen a dining room right. <laughs> yeah dining room table book and it's bigger than a coffee table yeah. <laughs> i also like yeah, this another... little piece here, here too that i thought was really awesome yeah, that was another collaborative piece without Williamson. And I believe that's the the um the rough to it. Yeah, then yeah they had the, the I know finish. that's what I liked about it, getting to see this kind of like 
different version of it from a different angle like even like the the hand coloring you know which everything's yeah. digitally now so you don't see that in comics anymore no i know we need to slow down and go back to that again because there's I mean, such a magic with that like the original snow white like oh my god i know um so this is so those that's from the from the um beginning of the book over there on the left those panels that he did in collaboration with al williamson right and I like that they put it in again. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So you can kind of see it more co cohesive of what it actually is. And that's a piece I've never seen either. I, I, I That kind of looks like a Williamson collaboration I, I piece. I think so, that. yeah. Because Williamson had a very distinct style as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. For sure. I mean, he's a absolute legend too, you know? It's just, and oh to see God. these two legends work together and like in this size, this format is just like, I mean, yeah, I we need an Al Williamson book, book Tashin. We need a Al, William, uh, Al Williamson a Tashin book would be awesome. Yeah, if Tashin's listening, get at yes. it. <laughs> Drop Diana line. I love like a lot of this here now too is going to be a lot of his comic book pages. A lot of stuff that I've never seen. Um, I've heard about it obviously because I've I've read about Frazetta before, but getting to see some of this stuff like the little Abner, the newspaper strip stuff that he did is just yeah, he did he did a lot of work when he was with when he was with Al Cap a lot how old is this one then that one I believe is from the 40s or 50s yeah because he doesn't even sign his name the same here like his signature does, does it say Fritz on that or what, what does that one say it says Frank Frazetta but then on the bottom it says um, I can't see who it's I'm gonna pull out my mock book too hold on okay he says you can have I, this George but please get me <laughs> I think that was George Woodbridge that he was referring to there. Here, I'm going to join oh, you now. I, I hate touch. Yes. Yes. Sometimes he would sign as Frankie. Page 73. Let me see. Okay. I'm going to it. I'm flipping. See, I'm getting anxious touching it right now. Like, I know. Oh, I hate that I'm touching this book too. To <laughs> no, no, no. I almost bought gloves just for this so that I didn't ruin it. Yeah. yeah so he just, but that was what his friend would call him, Frankie. So yeah, he signed it as Frankie, and yeah, it is, it's it is interesting to see how different his his signature was. So yeah, it was um it was actually George Russo's that he that he gifted this piece to. Okay. You yeah, can it have it, but please get me those Tarzans. So he was he was always like trying to like trade his art and get it. So some pieces he'd get rid of, and then he'd be like, oh no, I need, I need those back. Um, and then he'd do little favors and commissions. It smells so good. I know it does. <laughs> I love smelling the books. <laughs> um, you smell so the do ink. I. Uh, I. I can't wait to smell this one day when it's an old book, when I'm a really old woman and I'm just sitting there and sniffing does. the book. It's yeah, I'll be on the really... couch and I'll look over and he's like this. I, this book. <laughs> I can't help it. I love the smell it. of old books. Old books, I love old libraries. Comics. Yeah, old like bookstores. But yeah, so this is the original Snowman, the one I was mentioning earlier. Which transformed into those those um, those strips with John Gunta, but this is what John Gunta saw mm. and was like, "Wow, this little you know World War II propaganda snowman. There's something going on here." Um, and this is the first time it's ever been published like this before. And I, it, my grandpa was like, you know, doing this when he was twelve, thirteen years old, which is Get the fuck out pretty of remarkable. It. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's, that's what his I'm teacher like, said too. His teacher referred to him as a prodigy, so. Well, not at first. So what happened was the, the, his teachers were watching him draw the, I mean, he, he, he they would fill, he'd fill up the chalkboard with like the, any holiday with like Santa Claus, the Easter bunny. And all he would do was doodle all over his like, you know, assignments. He wasn't paying attention in school. Um, and his teachers were like, this kid's really good. So they're the ones that went to the teacher or his parents rather. And they were like, is he in art school? Like, do you know how good your son is? And you know, his grandma paid attention, but it was the, it was the, gosh, the Great Depression. They didn't have time to like encourage the kids. Um, so they were the ones that went to Brooklyn Academy of Fine Arts. And they're like, we have a, a, a prodigy. And, and, and Michelle Falanja was like, yeah, right. So then when he did see him working, he was like, oh, wow, he actually is a child prodigy. Now, now I'm going to mentor him. Yeah, these are, these, these are Nina strips. There's so much said with no words. I, yeah, like that's, that's, that's what really, like, I've never seen these before either. This is the first time I've seen it, seen these. And it's just the Gosh, I need to step it up has. on social media, Ryan. The fact that you haven't seen it, I'm like, what? <laughs> I need to post these more because they're, they're, they're some of his, I mean, the inks, like these, 
the way that he did like the rock and the water and it's just like there's so much power yeah. like you said there's like there's it's it's all it's very very emotional when you look at his 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 lines yeah the way she's kneeled over with her hands over her face or where, where the way she's laying her down her arms just like in the water yeah powerful images here i love this top one too where she's just falling into nothing yeah mm, his wind blown so and it says oh i love that i love that it says it's, it's, he she tells the story he was sitting with his friend roy crinkle and that is true and he did this he did wind blown in about 15 minutes Great. just like that you know <laughs> uh, you know no big deal i'm just gonna draw this real quick while we're talking yeah just like that right. i mean i've done i've tried to do a study of this one and it's like just to understand the genius behind it and i'm like wow just made it look so freaking easy he really does draw the best women i love this one right here on the on 89 yeah yeah yeah, yeah and these were real early because you see the signatures down there these were back yep 1948 love this oh, cover ghost right here. writer yeah, the Ghost Rider. So That's when sick. he really started hitting his stride in comics, Ghost Rider. So yeah, 1950. Love it. It's the energy coming off of that um, yeah. the page, you know? And I love getting to see this too, like the paste-ups that they would do on the covers and like the glue from age, from time just starts to brown, you know? Mm-hmm, yep. Go comic pages. Have a caption on that? Yeah, White Indian. Was from white indian so that was 1949 right, brief right before um he did the ghost rider like i said the ghost rider was the one that was like really when he was starting to hit his stride and yeah, comics I mean, you can see it for sure yeah you can see that it's like a very it's crazy because like the progression's quick like it's it's like when someone would put something in his head it was ralph mayo that told him right before judy of the jungle which is a comic he worked on he said he's like frazetta you don't know anatomy my grandpa's like what? And he goes, yeah, I do. Look what I'm drawing. He's like, no, 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 you really don't know anatomy. So he gave him this George Bridgman book and he said, go home and study anatomy. You can bring the book back to me when you know it. Don't, you know, don't rush. So my grandpa went home and he, he copied it front to back in one night and he brought it back to Mayo and said, oh, I learned anatomy. Thank you. And Mayo was like, kid, are you serious? Like, you're, you're crazy. He's like, I'm still learning anatomy and I'm like 30 years older than you. But he really mayo even said this mayo said wow he goes you know there was a difference like i noticed his next work it improved so he clearly retained something from that that those 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 studies that he did wow should we skip over some of the comics and get to some of the other pieces or yeah yeah if you want to do that because this okay. is a big this is a this is long <laughs> yeah i mean i mean don't get me wrong i love all of it um you know getting to see like the johnny comet stuff but i want to see some they all they all look like frank yeah, right here. I mean, look at this. One, yeah, one, his nine. cars. His cars were so good. His race cars, his planes. Everything. I don't think there's anything he couldn't draw or paint. No, you're right. There is There is nothing that he couldn't draw or paint. I mean, that, that's his Johnny Comets are just incredible because I just they feel like it pulled out so much of that personality in him. Like when he would say that he was an enigma, like he had that sensitive side, that quirky side, and then he had that really like super masculine, um, um, you know, forceful tarzan man inside of him as well and that right. this book gives that gives the, that overview very well i don't know why but this particular face reminds me of like lucille ball but just a little bit heavier in the in the cheeks yeah i can see a lot of uh lucille ball references actually okay all right I, i'm glad it wasn't just me because yeah. like, i looked at no. it and i'm like dude that looks like even like this page right here like from behind for some reason just like the shape of her head where their hair look, reminds me of lucy yeah yeah. The yeah, there was some Barbara Eden and sorry, Lauren, Oh, Barbara Eden, that makes sense too. Yeah. Yeah. The painting in the beginning, I saw the guy look like Clint Eastwood, but I didn't say anything. Yeah. Ever... Yeah. I mean, I mean he's friends Clint with him, right? and, he him. Yeah, they knew each other. But I mean, a lot of people would say that my grandpa looked like Clint Eastwood. So I think oh. I think most of the men were typically my grandpa. Oh, okay. he, he thought he, he knew he was very attractive. So he, he liked <laughs> like, to pull right from here, him. the softness of her face right here is incredible it's just incredible like the lips the eyes just like and then the contrast of like right here like i wish i had some of these original comics you know like these are just i mean at least i i have them here but like i'd I love to get to like see some of those 
Well, they, we do have them here, Ryan. So when you visit, we have um, his Johnny Comets here. We have about like 10 of them. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm And some of the Ace McCoys where they're just, I love that. See that old man running that silhouette? That's like hilarious to me. Like that's so my grandpa. That's like his personality. Then, yeah, that. look at this guy with the cigar in his mouth too. Like, Yeah, all of his personal love stories. Oh my God, those were so good. Those are my favorite. Like, right like all, yeah. That that looks like Lucy. I, I don't know. Maybe like maybe it's just I don't know. I, I can see it. I've watched a lot no, of he, Lucy, so maybe that's kind of where. Well, he like head. I mean Mar Marilyn Monroe. Like I mean all of the just the the um, Aubrey. What is it? I can't think of her name. Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn. Hepburn. Yeah. Yeah, Audrey Hepburn. Like I mean, all of the classic beauties heavily yeah. inspired him. He had good taste. Yeah, I mean, I, I that's like one of my favorite eras of uh, like the way women, the fashion even with women back then, you know, like I love I love that stuff. Before we started wearing pants. <laughs> 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 with our nice uh, fitted skirts and dresses. I do have well, to I don't say, know, the I hair love, too, I, the hair, like, because I had hair. to take a fashion design class when I was in high school. Some For some reason, they put me in there. And we had to like That's study cool. the history of fashion with women. And it was cool to see like, I really loved the twenties too, of the way women dress in the twenties. Um, and then the fifties, the twenties and the fifties were always something that stood out to me. You know, it's funny. I, I hear like a lot of men say that. And I, I, I do, I just, I feel very good and feminine when I am dressed like this, actually. <laughs> okay. What were we pointing at? This? The planets. Oh, on, one thir on 131? Planets. Yeah. yeah. I know. I love all yeah. the Rogers stuff. I mean, it's just. This page too, page one thirty, um, with uh, what is that from? Fam Buck Rogers featured famous funnies number two fourteen, mm -hmm. ink over oh. graphite on board. Yeah, his his famous funnies were just incredible. Oh, there, and then All we got that page again. We have the black and white version of that uh, Buck Rogers cover. I, I much prefer the black and white. They were, they you were know, great. so do I. I kind of like the art unencumbered by anybody else touching it sometimes you know yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm with you on that 100 percent. Like, can we just do more like black and white comics I, I, maybe <laughs> i wish i say it all the time i, I feel like black and I white too. Like, it, it creates a different kind of experience you know yeah sometimes you just don't need the color mm -hmm. so I, I noticed on page 138 it says to wally best always at the bottom of the page Wally Wood. Mm, that that would be Wally Wood. Yep. He was uh he was a honorary member of the Flegel gang. So he'd pop in from time to time and hang out with all of them. They had just such a they had such a great like group of friends that motivated each other and and they just like all they 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 really it was it was having that community that they motivated each other to do art and that's that's something real special. Yeah. Had a lot of community back then. I know the the that era is just full of amazing amazing artists some that like like wally wood died way too young i think like yeah there's a lot we didn't get to see with him um oh my god yeah it's terrible so he's just drawing on the on the back of like a paper right like corn oh that see one the, the silhouette paper, yeah. yeah i'm just i'm sorry i'm, I'm smelling the book <laughs> i just got <laughs> it just got in a trance i'm like this page smells really good yeah. extra ink on this page yeah <laughs> Yeah, his came the dawn. Oh my gosh, if he would have finished this story, but he didn't finish it. He never got around to it. It's crazy. Look at her jeans. But I like it. There has a, such a, a a magic on it, even with like just seeing some of the pieces, having just like the pencil lines and and having it incomplete. It actually is just maybe maybe it was just meant to be this way. Yeah, I mean, I love the way it's telling the story of like you know the hunter as Frank's avatar admires the the denim clad buttocks of his visitor. And then just like each panel, you know, because this is just these are just the panels. And he thinks she's the killer. It's crazy and throws her outside. <laughs> yeah. It's a good story. I like it. EC. I haven't I haven't read many EC stories, but from what I the little excerpts, I I like them a lot. I need to hopefully I mean EC is being well maintained right now by Bill Gaines' grandson, Corey. So hopefully he brings more things back. Yeah, I, I mean I want to see just a straight Frazetta book with all his stuff. That's I mean, mm. it's a missed opportunity mm -hmm. if they don't do that, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Frank Frazetta. So another copyright um, example, when we get to page 150, the Sheba 
it was oh, um, yeah. dated 1954, and then there again is the 76. But I have to say, I'm, I, as much as I study his work now, I'm truly biased on his work in the 50s. I love his 50s era. I think it's my favorite out of all of them. Same. All the pieces. Yeah, I, mean, the I era, thought this was the 70s. You know, like that's that's what's crazy. Right. It's like I didn't even see this piece as, as constructed on this page. Like I only saw the colored piece. Yeah, no, it's it's. The, the ink as as it on a, on its own is incredible. I mean that background, that design that he oh, did. But yeah, his line work and the way he renders is just the the level of detail that he puts. I don't know what size some of these are because I don't. Oh yeah, I guess it does say the size. So yeah. yeah, it says the size, but I'm I'm I agree with you. Like I've never I I mean I post them online, but you miss a lot of the detail um, until you see the scans blown up like this. Look, I love his Tarzan stuff. I know the, the the Tarzan stuff is some of my favorite. I know he was a huge fan of Tarzan. Oh, Hal Foster was his his idol and Tarzan. I mean, he was Tarzan. It was like his whole mm-hmm. life goal. Is he's like, I am the living, breathing Tarzan. Yeah, and this piece, uh, actually, that watercolor right on the right, that was directly from Hal Foster. Oh wow! He just he just swiped it right from Hal Foster and made it his own. This is another one. He was really proud of the Lord of the Savage Jungle. Again, this ink, this inking is masterful, to say the least. Just the power in it, you know. Yeah, I love this one too. The the one on a one sixty, yeah. the golden line. This oh yeah, one I, yeah. This one has always stuck in my mind. That one's it, this one's always like kind of weirded me out a little bit with like how the um the front delt is of the lion. Like it's a, it's a strange like it doesn't seem correct. And oh it's yeah, like the way those, that is. Yeah, but it's like one of those pieces again. Like, of course, he knew what he was doing. He knew the anatomy of of the lion, but he was bending bending the rules again because he, he knew the rules and he knew how to break them. So it's one of those again those those Frazetta moments. But when I would look at it, it would just make me feel uncomfortable. Like, I don't know why this makes me feel uncomfortable. I think it's like too much too much personality in that in that lion. So he's really <laughs> weirding me out. <laughs> here we go. Here's the stuff. The stuff right here. Conan, you know, I just, I can't, I can't, again, I can't thank my grandfather enough for, you know, putting Conan, to just really depicting Conan, how Conan should be depicted. And here it is. And it, did you ever hear the story? Um, well, you can see it, see on the right of the, the rough work. Yeah. So when he did the cover and it's published this way, Conan really didn't have a neck and it was Roy Crankle who had he kid can't he came over to my grandfather's house and according to crankle my grandpa didn't remember it this way but my grandpa was also like much older at the time when he was being asked about it but roy crankle said that he took off conan's head um and said frank you, you didn't but before that he said you you didn't he didn't give him a neck what are you doing <laughs> so he looked at it and he was like oh my god i didn't give him a neck so then he wiped the head off and he, he gave him a neck and then he he rendered the girl a little bit differently and i'm glad that i mean the the repaint with this is a little touch-ups i mean this is this is just this is frazetta this piece is the definition of frazetta and yeah. it's like i always sit there and stare at conan and the the the, the amazing rendering of the muscles and his face but then like when you really look at the background i mean it's i know with the skulls and stuff and the yeah fire. yeah i definitely just like really knew how to tell a story yeah oh yeah each painting that he does tells a story and i love how well, the, the woman's face is in front of his leg in the yeah. finished piece as opposed to like behind more behind it yeah and like and then just like the mound with like the tiny brush strokes it's not no not much detail just because like and that's I think I think why it stands the test of time is it's just he knows how to get your eye to go from one point to the next and it's like you're when you're, you're looking at it you just feel this experience of of like appreciating great composition and the circular and the triangular and the shapes and it's just so appealing in in every way another iconic one yeah, that was one of my favorites which one the 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 chained yeah or the usurper like you can like just you can feel the fear like you can feel the fear but you can feel him like the energy that the strength it's taking for him to pull on those chains yeah how he did the weight i don't know yeah. i don't know the technical the technicality of how you do that but it's it's pretty amazing and i actually 
again, blowing it up to this scale, I never really took the time to see that shadow of the demon all the way in the back and that Same. bird creature. And it, it's like, oh my gosh, so much of his pieces, I can see where um, where Jim Hansen, Dark Crystal was influenced from. There was one in the At The Earth's Core. And then you can see that up in the right corner there. Where I'm like, oh, that that definitely inspired Dark Crystal. It's very interesting. And we have his man ape, the one over in the left before you turn, uh, Conan man ape that oh, was on Conan yeah, Volume yeah. Five. Yeah, we have that original here in the museum, and that oh. one's just. Yeah, I can't. I really can't wait to get to that museum. I I want to oh. see these things up close and personal. You know, I'm gonna be the guest of honor, both of you. <laughs> yeah, Another and then this one. Really like. Yeah, and that one's owned by Kirk Hammett. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, he bought that for got that Metallica money. That's why. I mean, that makes sense that that's I, a piece he would buy. <laughs> Actually, you know, like well, I like, it. yeah, and I like that Kirk. He he, I mean, he hasn't done the tour in a, a a bit now because of COVID. But like before that, he was touring all of his art, and that's really cool. So I think it's like if the collection um, sells from from other Frazetta heirs, like I, it's it's important to have it go into another collection that's going to be putting it out in the world and having people be able to see it and appreciate it. So yeah, totally we're agree. thankful that Kirk does that. And then his then his um Ringo Starr changed everything for him, put him put him on the map as an illustrator that they should definitely hire and got him all of those movie poster jobs that he didn't love doing the movie posters because you know he had to have the character and it was um just more of a a technical process rather than this energy of um a visceral energy but they paid really well. So he took those jobs at the time. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I didn't even know until maybe a year and a half ago, a couple, maybe a couple of years ago, like that he did some of these movie posters because he does the likenesses so well, but it's not he does. like photo, like it's not realistic. I like that. He puts his flair on it, you know? Yeah, no, I agree with you. The spiders in the background of that one they're they're hilarious I'm just gonna yeah. say they're creeping me out <laughs> yeah yeah and he gives you something he get, he brings that brings his 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 women his men his animals he brings them to life he puts yeah. soul in them i really love how much of his watercolor stuff is in here yeah his watercolors i mean god just made it again look so easy watercolors are so difficult yeah, this, yeah, one, this one to be watercolor. Look at that. Like, yeah, like, the cover for Tarzan and the Lost Empire. Amazing. The purples that he did. Because purple is like probably one of my favorite colors. So like, I love seeing mm -hmm. his it taste. Of everything. Yeah, and then the Tarzan and the castaways. They just I, I can appreciate going through it again. Like the design, like the choices Diane made to have the Tarzan at the castaways next to this Tarzan and the Lost Empire piece. It's just, it's brilliant. It's crazy that the size of these originals is smaller than a or it's about the size of a notebook paper yep it's crazy how much detail <laughs> he's putting into that because like most most like comic book artists are drawing at 11 by 17 or larger you know mm -hmm. he's drawing smaller than that and doing more detail than some of these artists that are drawing on a larger scale so it's pretty crazy to see yeah, his eyes were really good i'm telling you like the pieces we have this beauty and the beast ink in here and oh my god it's so small it's about three inches high and the detail is it's 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 just so it's magical yeah. this was another piece that he really really loved this one i believe was um he he sold this to his friend dave winowitz he had it in his collection up until 19 or uh 2015. now it's in another private collection hopefully one day it will be in our collection yeah, his dinosaurs are always so cute, mm -hmm. too. I love this creature right here. I mean, is that a dinosaur? What is that? I, I would think it's a dinosaur. Um, Well, something of Edgar Rice Burroughs. But yeah. it's um, but someone asked the other day, they're like, what's going on with the leg? There's just, what I loved about my, with, with, with that with the dragon dinosaur's leg, like a lot of the times my grandpa would just purposely leave out a leg or um an arrow or whatever because he just cared about the design over being correct mm -hmm. um so he would just push the boundaries just all for the sake of of design um and that would sometimes mean leaving out a few body parts which is interesting oh here's the ribbon i just found my ribbon i like the ribbon too in the book no i love it can you hear the jurassic park music it just got really loud <laughs> <laughs> oh this is a beautiful piece right here 
Wow. What are those colors? There? I know. And no composition like that he does. Like that's something I have to mention. Like they're all different. He doesn't use yes. like the same poses over and over. He doesn't go back to the well. You know, he's constantly like changing what you're seeing. It's always a fresh angle or a fresh shot. Oh, because it would just bore him to death. Then he mm. wouldn't even do art. So he was always just pushing the limit with himself and and trying to be reinvent himself all of the time. I love, I, I do like, what do you think, Ryan, about the black? I like the black. I like the it black. Makes them, yeah. I've never seen it, that, something like this before. I know. That's why like, I'm afraid to touch it because I don't want my fingerprints going on it. But I know. <laughs> now that I'm noticing, it's not picking up fingerprints. Like when you touch it, oh. like normally a... a when you touch a like a book with black pages, your fingerprints on it. Like I've been holding mm. this and it's not picking it up, which is awesome. Oh, I love this one too. The frost giants. Mm -hmm. Great piece. Again, with the help of his friend Roy Crankle. God, this is, I love how he's he's grabbing his neck. Split it. Yeah. Like the peak, the peak action always. What's the most interesting part of the story? And that's what Frank Rosetta would capture. You just see like in art, there's just a lot of stagnation mm -hmm. and it doesn't keep my attention as well as, as like Frazetta to hold my attention with art. I totally and It's agree. just because there's just so much to look at and take in and the eye just kind of dances around. Like I said earlier, I love it. I really like this piece. This, um, where are we at now? Okay. We're at Carson of Venus. Oh, you want oh, what you're talking about the, the piece right here no the dinosaurs yeah, is that like center of the earth or something this is a um, oh, land that time forgot the land, land of terror forgot. i just love that piece yeah, it is there's really so much cool. going on it's such a strange composition and i love it it's another awesome yeah. piece. this reminds yeah, me this... of uh the land before time one. yeah i haven't seen this yeah so originally there were two little men in the in the water there um, and then he painted them, I believe he oh. painted them out and then he painted them back in again. So right now the version has the men in, in it. Um, but we only had the excessive, um, the access to this, this scan. Um, so in, it was like in the, in, in the, um, in the limbo phase, mm -hmm. but it's really, really powerful when you see the two little men standing up there and how small they are at scale compared to t-rex there it's a it's a really great piece yeah. i love those trees in the water the branches coming down the roots i uh, see neither one of these pieces first time i've ever seen these two i love this like i don't know what the hell that is but i love yeah, the I don't color know. of that so much i mean it's a warthog isn't it yeah it's an alien warthog. beast it's alien it, it, they're 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 beasts of venus that's okay. what they are I gotta say, this one I think is like one of the most underrated Frazetta pieces. It doesn't get talked about nearly enough, and it's just it's my it's first just time incredible. seeing it. Really? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I, I love. It's great though. It's what the book. I mean, was that's for. what I love about this book so much is that I'm seeing stuff for the first time I've never seen before. I, I mean, I have a lot of like the sketchbook type stuff that they put out mm -hmm. for Frazetta, you know, um, but yeah. not as much with the reproduction of the paintings. Like, look at that little castle up there. I love the sky, the colors he uses in the I sky. Love the sky. You can get all Frazetta's emotions in his backgrounds. And his, of course, is, is more of his women. Mm -hmm. 1963, 1964. Yeah, they're, and the, the Lion Queen up there in the, that, I mean, that was, it's, a, it's colored pencil and it's, it's four by five inches. I mean, look at the, look at that detail. Such <laughs> a small piece and it's a colored pencil. Now, so Sea Witch, this is a really, this is, so a lot of um, uh, people have seen Sea Witch when it's uh, more saturated and you can then see more details. And a lot of publishers have done this in the past, but Tashin kept it at its its um, natural form. I've seen Sea Witch many times in person and it's this dark. Um, so, you know, there's something interesting about highlighting it so you can see maybe more of the rock details but this is how this is how he wanted it to look and i think he wanted to keep it of course like darker just so he could really illuminate the sea witch and always have that like really great focal point and i love how it's paintings like this where you guys are pulling for the frazetta verse of comics you know like 
one-off characters or maybe like they've been in a couple paintings and, and pulling that in and, and making like this yeah. universe of his paintings it's phenomenal yeah we'll, we'll get there <laughs> the Frazetta universe is growing so we have this piece um up in the left hand corner that's that's um that's actually my grandmother um it says it in the in the caption it says yeah, a close resemblance Ellie to Ellie Frazetta but that that was actually my grandma and um, like I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of there were a lot of women that you pull from. And right here, here's Barbara Eden that I mentioned earlier. That's definitely Barbara Eden's face. Um, so but 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 a couple of times my grandpa would, of course, just like sit down and and render my grandmother. And, and this was one of them. It's beautiful. Yeah. In, the, in the original that we have here in the museum, you can see all like the pencil smudges because he just loved using his fingers to smudge the pencils in shadow. and shadow. That's really special to see. That. You'll have to come here and see it in person. <laughs> even look at like the, the bottom there with like the rocks and stuff. Like even mm -hmm. though it's like so minimal, you can still feel the texture. Love this too, hugging the side of a building and like Yeah, she has a great rear. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cool stuff too, right here. His notebooks. Oh, yeah, this, this is, is what I live for. I love seeing this stuff. Getting like this is like the peak behind the curtain. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm happy they included this one too. Has the um, the ink brush, pencil, all kinds of all kinds of great stuff going on, and even just in these like little doodles, you just again you feel that weight. No, oh, I know it's crazy, and like I said, you just the poses. His poses are all he's he's so playful with them too. You know, yeah, yeah, like we're. Where were women doing this? They're like flying around. <laughs> I love, this one is insane. The, like how how real that hand looks right there. But then this you have one, tiny little women all over it, you know? like Yeah. So this one was directly influenced from Fantasia. Okay. Um, so at Night on, Bald, uh, Night on Bald Mountain, the last sequence, um, the uh, Chernabog has his hand out and he has all these little like blue and green demon ladies all over the hand and I'm pretty sure that's where this is like yeah, maybe again my grandpa would always say I don't know I didn't swipe from anything so maybe he just like stored it in because he just loved it so much mm -hmm. and then this this came out of it um, but this one was actually it's, it says oil on board but it actually had a little bit of gouache in it um, so it was a bit more of a, it was more mixed media. And we have this original here in the museum as well. I love that piece. It is so good. And then this, we have this also in the museum. This is Rogue Roman. So Rogue Roman um, was never in the museum before because it was in my grandfather's studio because he loved to just stare at these women. And he thought they were probably like, I mean, up there, Cat Girl was his favorite, Frazetta Girl. But these were right behind Cat Girl. He was, he was like, all all three of these women, I, I perfected them. Perfect. And I, I agree. I, I think the um, I think the girl on the bottom is one of my favorites that he ever painted. Yeah, I agree. Look, I mean, look at the eyes. The way, They're so piercing, yeah. you know? Yes. Yeah, they look they look right through you. Yeah. Like, how, how, how is she looking through me? She's on a canvas. <laughs> So this is the prelim I was mentioning earlier. So we had this uh, professionally photographed. This is also in my mom's collection. And that's this is the first time that it's ever been published. So again, it was inspired by Fantasia, which was released in 1940. And I, you know, I think he was planning on doing um, a full oil, but he just he never got around to it, unfortunately. Very sad about that. But sometime he did this sometime in the 1960s. Yeah, and he was only 12 when that movie came out. Can't imagine. Yeah. Tells yeah, from the crypt. Nice love this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> These are awesome right here. Like all the blues in this one. Yeah. I know. I love some of his horror stuff that he does. Like for mm -hmm. ears. Well, he was such a, I mean, the, the classic horror films, like those were huge for him too. Like he loved them. He, I mean, we watched like Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, um, all the, um, just what a Frankenstein meets, was it, was it what Frankenstein meets? Dracula or was it Wolfman? I think it was Wolfman. Um, yeah, but that. Abbott and Costello, they all did like this, like the old, just the old, any of the old horror stuff. He was, he, he was hugely influenced by. So when he had an opportunity to work on them, he was super excited. It's like, yes, get to do Wolfman again. It's awesome. Look at that. Look at the castle. Yes. Look at the moon. Yeah. His, his architecture, like he was, I mean, he, he had um, a piece come up in auction. I don't believe it's not included in this book, but 
he had his whole like future dream house mapped out and he designed it. And then he, of course he designed the museum that they built in Pennsylvania that was on the property. Um, so, I mean, he just, like, again, it's like we talked about, he can do anything, but I would have liked to see him do more structures, more architecture. It would have been very interesting. Yeah. I'd love to see that. And then of course, Wolf Moon. I mean, again, just so powerful. I love this part, the coloring in that. Yeah, his 60s, the 60s, he really kicked ass. <laughs> when you sit here and you like look through it all and you're like, wow, I can't believe how much he worked in mm -hmm. the 1960s. No wonder, no wonder he got a little tired. <laughs> wow. I like the glow See, right. in this. Yeah. Just the line work on two on the muscles on the arm, the fish in the corner. Mm -hmm. I like this one. The Spider Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that little, that little touch of green that was really important to him. And his secret people. Yeah, the secret people. I mean, look at that and, and think about the fact that that's watercolor. It's Whoa. her dress. They like started talking about loving that era of like the dresses and everything. Look at that. I mean, that's. I know. The folds. I, and wish, the they would, I wish they would design a dress that looked like that. Like some fashion <laughs> house needs to make dress. Frazetta, Frazetta <laughs> fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I'd wear that dress. I'd love to have that dress. I don't see anything that looks like that unless it's like, you know, costs $5,000. Yeah. <laughs> And his war art again, so powerful. I like that they kept this this combat piece. They let kept the little sketches because that's yeah, yeah. that's how the original is. Yeah, I love it. Wasn't wasting any paper that day. You haven't seen a lot of these war ones either. Yeah, these are all his blazing combats. Yeah, it's just interesting when you when you do when I when I study his art and it's like I grew up around it. I I remember of course seeing it all back to my childhood, and when you when you're just looking at it and not really trying to study it those focal points are so strong that you have to go back and like look at things and look at it again look at it again and that's what just keeps you so enthralled is like the ability to find something new almost every time you look and study it this one right here the sorcerer um, that's another character that they put into the comic books recently yes issue number six the sorcerer yeah. This one always surprised me. Um, Thane Barbarian of Fear. Yeah, he looks creepy as hell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he was on the cover of Creepy Number Twenty Seven. Yeah, perfect. Oh yeah, in the brain. Yeah, this one. This one. I again. I it was at um Norman Rockwell Museum, and I saw that for the first time in person. And boy, they did a great job once again with the reproduction on this. Yeah. Swamp Swamp Demon. Demon, Witch of the Dark. Yep. Oh, I love that. I haven't seen this before. Ponytail. Yeah, like, ponytail. Like, the, like yeah, the preliminary. I I, oh, I haven't seen this one before. Like the position that she's standing in. You can feel again, you can feel the weight in her leg, the way her foot is positioned right there. Yeah. So I'm talking about like powerful women, like that I don't know what she is, half woman, but she's like she's you know, she's scary. I wouldn't want to be I wouldn't want to be him looking up at her. Like that <laughs> face. She's a very like sinister, sinister little face with like an elf ear. It's yeah. very interesting. Um, this this green death. This is a this is a fantastic reproduction, as well as mm, I think we're fixing this one too. We'll just skip over these this this little section. Okay. Right. <laughs> then we get to T Rex. This is this is love dinosaurs. I mean, I think again it was like back to King Kong and just like that whole world. He he loved it. He did say, though, he was like, I don't think I, he said that he was disappointed that he didn't have any, um, a lot of references to pull from because he would have been, he would have reworked his renderings of, of T-Rex right. um, if he had known more about the dinosaurs. And they still look fantastic, in my opinion. So. I think so, too. Oof, You're yeah, just being funny. super critical. I love that they blew this one up on the two page spread because mm -hmm. a lot of the times when you see this, there's a lot of space above these mountains because that's what he did for, for space for the paperback. And you can never tell that there's those two people hanging off the edge of the cliff. Yeah. So they blew it up enough to where you can see clearly that. see that. And then his Neanderthals. Oh. They did a great job with this. A lot of the times with Neanderthals, you can't see the raw Masonite um, mm -hmm. but, um, on, on the main Neanderthal. And on this one, you can. And I'm actually sitting right in front of it, and it looks great. Oh, wow. You have the ball over there, man. I know. Yeah, we have quite a bit. This one's dope right here. Love this one. 
Mm -hmm. texture on the rock right here. Yeah, that's incredible. Oh, I love this one too. Thor's, yeah, Thor's flight. Thor's flight. Yeah, this, Thor's flight inspired uh, fire and ice later on. The dragon hawks, which okay. was on in '68. This one's this one to me is iconic too, right here. Oh yeah, one with sight. I mean, yeah. that is like that's the power symbol for all witchy women. <laughs> Love that we get this step by step too. Longor against the gods. This is pretty dope too. Yeah, this piece has, has influenced so many different things. I mean, this is one of the it's like Death Dealer. Like you see this one emulated so many times and then like ripped off. And it's it's just a, it's really powerful. This 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 might or might not be appearing in all in the comics we're discussing. Oh, okay. So this danger planet. This mm -hmm. is the one that George Lucas bought for eight hundred dollars. Oh. 800 bucks that's insane i know there we go now we're into the 70s you got a quote by arnold over here arnold's great arnold what a, he's a real nice guy another character that might be appearing in the present of earth the norseman nice here's the death yeah. dealer here's death dealer this is his baby this is his baby his, his death baby and again, it's that same effect that he would do, like with just the triangular composition. He always come back to the red eyes and the helmet. Um, he intentionally made the horse tail like small, and ever, all the details were very loosely rendered on the bottom. And but just so it would always come back to that that axe and and that helmet. I mean, the detail on the chainmail, though, it's brilliant. It's crazy, yeah. and then the saddle. The it's just look at that. Look at the intricacies of the like yeah. the saddle he's sitting on. Here we go. There's Clint. There's Clint. So Clint ended up. He did. My grandpa did five rough works um, for this project, this movie poster, and he told my grandma his least favorite. And he goes, "Watch." He goes, "They're just gonna pick the one that I don't like." And my grandma's like, "Well, why don't you not include that one?" And he didn't listen, so he included it. And sure enough, they picked his least favorite rough uh, work. And yeah. I mean, I like it. I like it too. But uh, you know, you're your own worst critic. Yeah, that's and true. that's true for Frazetta. Yeah. And then we have Kane. So this was on the cover of Carl Edward Wagner's Dark Crusade. But as we saw earlier, it was most well known for Molly Hatchet. Oh, yeah. There's a lot going on in Ghoul Queen. It's a fun piece. Yeah. Now, there's something I have to point out too is he draws feet very well. Like I've always heard artists say that feet is like one of the hardest things to draw, but and he hands. and hands, but he does such hands. a good thing with both, and the like, just like the expressiveness in the hands too. Like the 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 way she's got her hand on her hip, like you can feel the the sass in it. You know, you can feel the sass in it, and it's it's funny enough. He hated drawing feet and hands, so any any time that he could hide one, he would. Oh, nice. Never like in, in this example right here, New World. So this this piece also is in George Lucas's collection. Mm -hmm. And it's a piece that I have never seen before in person. When he opens, I'm going to run right to that piece in the museum. So that would be my favorite of, of all of the ones he owns. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, he has a Egyptian you, queen. When you come out here, you have to hit us up. Oh, for sure. Whoa. So Dina, this one I uh, this one I recently saw in person. This was in a uh, private collector's um, in his in his collection that he brought to Orlando for an event we hosted with Jade City Foods, and this was unbelievable in person. Like you just the reproduction, it's it's fine, but the 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 original, mm -hmm. it's just so soft and oh, it's 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 really really incredible. Um, and I hope to work with that collector at some point and maybe we can tour my mom's collection, his collection, because seeing them in person, there's just something that just, just moves you in, entirely. Oh, this one looks great. The Flight of Icarus. Yeah. This is Birdman. Yeah. This is, he definitely needs to be in the Frazetta verse. Yes. Yeah. We have some, we have some announcements coming with that soon of what, where, where, where we're going. So that will be, that'll be fun. This one went through some transitions too. So this was the this was the um, again like the limbo phase. There was a um, a little a little guy that was kind of like a Indiana Jones in the middle of all of these creatures being attacked. And then there was a a blonde woman, and then another blonde woman, and then and then nothing, and then a final another blonde woman. 
Um, but this is again, the scan that we had. And right now, I don't know who owns this, but um, it's just this like a, a, a little Frazetta girl with her hands going up, like saying stop to the, mm -hmm. to the demons. A male study. Alien crucifixion. We have a mini series coming out about this painting. This is um, going to be written by Denton, uh, Denton Tipton. He is the he's the editor at Opus. Yeah. But he's also writing the series for this. Uh, Alien crucifixion. Oh, okay. Which is interesting. I was like, really? Like you're gonna you want to do a short story based on that? But he did, and I read it, and I was I really really like it. So Denton's Denton's great. Knows a lot about history. Very smart. Yeah, I can't wait. To, I can't wait for all the, the. I mean, the anthology book and then the Mothman book, and I'm sure there's other stuff. I mean, I know that from what I've seen, they're selling pretty well, and everybody's really digging them. That gets them at the shop. Oh, that's I, great. That makes me happy to hear. Yeah, his flippers. <laughs> oh, this one I like treat. a lot too. The book of paradox. Yeah, I can't ever tell what that that first character really is. Is it a male? Is it a female? Does it matter? Um, it, it it almost looks like he or she is like wearing pants, but not. It's it's an interesting piece. Yeah. Um, I do I love those those women up on top though. Same. Like these sorceresses, they're incredible. She looks like she has bird wings around her. It's just like the tree has eyes, does it? Yes. Death. It does have eyes, right? It definitely, it definitely has eyes. Okay. Yeah. And this one he did, the serpent. Mm -hmm. Um, he was actually it was it was in 1972. He was with Russ Cochran and he was with my uncle Billy in his studio. And Russ asked him to take out a canvas, canvas board, and he said, just paint something, Frank, whatever comes to your mind. And he just started with this S shape. My uncle, this was my, according to my uncle, he just started with this S shape and rendered this in just like a few hours right in front of them. And I think my uncle said like, that was when, when, well, my uncle said, that's when he thinks that it really set into his brain that, wow, my father is extremely gifted. I can't believe he just whipped that out in a few hours. And with just the, the for, first form the, being like just an S, a simple shape. Another one of my favorites. Yeah, this one sold um, right before my grandpa passed away. He sold this and it, it went for over a million. He was really proud of it. Of course, he would never spend that in his life. But, you know, it was still about it was about record breaking and that competitive nature in him. Yeah. No, it's an incredible piece. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would, I would go for well over a million nowadays for sure. Oh yeah, this one should be like twenty million. <laughs> yeah. Whoever got it got a good deal. They definitely did. Love this Lord of the Rings stuff he's got in here. It's Middle Earth. Yeah, no, no one was wearing pants and and Frazetta's Lord of the Rings and his Gollum. So this is the other piece I saw recently, Devil Rider. Devil Rider Again, okay. I had yeah, I saw this at the Milk House in Orlando. It's a funny name seeing Frazetta's at the Milk House, but it was a great little uh, venue. And this was again just it, it, beautiful. The scan's perfect. Yeah, this is the first time I've seen this for sure. And the bucking bronco and Madame Derringer. And this the also I've seen the pencils of this before. Mm, the rough works, yeah. yeah. This, this this was also at 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 that event, and it was, it was so powerful. Gosh, I really like this sunset piece too with the cowboys. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, this was in a private collector's um, house, and I, this I think that he had four Frazetta originals, and it was out in uh, California, and they all got stolen. Uh, someone um, burglar burglarized his house when he was out in Europe, and he came back, and everything was gone. So that's one of the Frazetta pieces that is missing right now. Oh my god, that's horrible. It would be terrible. So terrible. I feel so bad for him. And this Flashman at the Charge, yeah. um, this or a uh, Flash Flashman at the Charge, but Flash for Freedom rather just sold for, I believe it was like around six sixty at auction. Um, but Flashman at the Charge, this is in my mom's collection, and mm -hmm. I'm also sitting under it, and oh, oh beautiful. Now Frazetta got broke a lot of rules, and he got away with it because he was so freaking good, and they wanted his work on the covers. But uh, she wasn't supposed to be nude. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't the assignment. But he didn't he didn't care. <laughs> this is an awesome piece. I don't think I've seen this one. The mm -hmm. Seven Romans. Yeah, this was on um, Marvel's Epic Illustrated. 
Okay. So maybe maybe yeah. I have seen it. I just didn't like look at it close because I remember um at the shop I work at, we we had a collection of like the epic illustrateds, but they were too okay. in my blood. But I probably yeah, you'd probably I, I, I would guess you'd like this one with the purples again. Yeah, I do. And his Roman chariot. Oh. Part of his cane saga. Castle of Sin. This one is so Yeah, his women are always naked no matter where they are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what they're doing. They're, they're just they're there. Naked. Oh, these are awesome. These preliminaries. More unused I conans. I love that they didn't crop out like the the part where you tear it out of a notebook. Same. I really like Same. that they left it this way. Very interesting to look yeah. at it in its total natural form. Oh, here it is, Lauren. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorites. This, this is uh, one that Lauren's recreated she drew <laughs> oh lauren i'm gonna have to see that this one so this is another missing painting this painting's been missing for over oh goodness 13 years now oh, wow. and we have we have no idea of the, the whereabouts of cane on the golden sea oh, yeah. and of course silver warrior yeah silver warrior was painted back to back with death dealer one um, my grandpa was told that, you know, he was, again, he just go through periods of his career when people would say, oh, he's washed up. He's not that good art critics. And then he would just say, all right, I'll show them. And then he painted Silver Warrior and Death Dealer one back to back. This is awesome for a Dungeons and Dragons book. You know, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Well, I love this one. This one's at the earth's core that's another one do you favorite. see the do you see the dark crystal influence up there yes. look at that yes. yeah. right for sure this is awesome look at look at the way it's like hunched over and you can just like you don't even need to see the face of that to know how creepy mm -hmm. it looks on the front side yeah that's so interesting like now we're getting into starting to do more sculptures and uh, like bless you me. know having working with the bless you Thank um you. Do, starting starting more sculptures now and having the artists have to interpret like what's on the other side of the frisetta beast or creature that's it's it's interesting you know and it's, it's kubla khan's beautiful beautiful inking yeah and then of course one of his most popular pieces the um girl with dagger mm-hmm uh, the, the official title, the mastermind of Mars and and fighting man of Mars. But, you know, we call we call her girl with dagger. And I love that you can see because it was used with an ink brush. You can just see the different tones here on the scan. Oh, yeah, definitely. The washes. This is so much fun. I'm so glad we're doing this. Together. Oh, I, I'm so glad you agreed to do it with me. Because you know? I, I wanted is... to do this. I wanted to go through the book, you know, and I'm like, well, Fuck, I wonder if Sarah would be down to do it with me, you know? And then that's what I miss. Yeah. Because I think it's it's cool to get like anecdotes that I wouldn't know, you know, and like I think it's just fun to go with. I mean, I also really like talking to you. So oh well, the feelings mutual. Um, this is this was an interesting one. So this um women of the ages, this on the on the right, this ink. So um it was, I believe, 2013, and I had helped my mom sell this piece to a collector over in the UK. And it made me really sad because I'm like, we'll never see it again. And um, lo and behold, I walked at, to the event in Orlando on my grandpa's birthday. And the collector that displayed his work there, his, the Rosetta work there, had this in his collection. And he bought it from the guy in the UK. So now it was back in the States. And it was back like where we were, you know, helping curate this event. And I was like, oh, my God, it's not my collection. But it's still, again, in a collection that will be seen by, by everyone. And that's, that's what's important. The mastermind of Mars and fighting men of Mars. Again. Mm -hmm. It's from that from the cover for that, actually. Yes. The Moon Maid. That's a really awesome piece. Yeah, I love that Moon Maid. It's so good. I loved his version one of Moon Maid, too, though. It was like, uh, it was just so different. But I mean, I, I would say if, because he, cause he repainted it, he didn't do two actual two versions. Um, so you kind of have to pick like version one or version two. But when I really look at version two, it's like he did do it justice with a repaint. Mm -hmm. Another another mm -hmm. classic cover. Yes. Princess of Mars. Princess of Mars. And again, he did two versions of this, and this is definitely the, the better of the two. Just the, the textures on here are just insane. Death dealers. Just where the death dealers. Page. Oh, these are pretty awesome, too. Oh yeah, Battlestar Galactica. You want to stop at the Battlestar? Where was that? What page is that? That was uh three sixty one. 
this Battlestar Galactica. So his Battlestar Galactica pieces were all done for the TV guide. He did four illustrations. Um, the first one was Battlestar Galactica Attack. And then we have Scramble. Scramble's also here in the museum in Boca Grande. Um, this was this was an interesting piece. I have I have a write up on on Frazettagirls.com about the model and her experience. It was the ABC producer's girlfriend, and she mm -hmm. came and modeled for him. And you can you can see it very clearly. She said it was a great experience. Yeah, these are amazing. These this first time I'm definitely seeing these for sure. Like this Godmaker's piece, Torment. Mm -hmm. Torment is amazing. And then we get into 1980. Oh, we got a Dave Stevens five, quote. That's awesome. Year. I love Dave Stevens. I didn't even realize that. Oh my gosh, all these discoveries. I and I've I've looked through the book a, a few times. I've looked through the PDF. I mean, we we we've, we've looked, and it's just again, it's like it's it's like a Frazetta painting. The little things just keep popping up because there's just yeah. so much. <laughs> and his fire and ice. Oh, it's Tigra and that. I, everything about that movie poster is just. Oh, it's that was the other movie we watched together over and over and over again. Of course, it was his movie, so why wouldn't we? But love that movie. Yeah, I can't wait for that comic that you kind of teased uh, oh. the last time we were talking. I just read through script three, and it was, oh, my God, so good. So good. I cry in the happy tears, not sad oh, tears. God, Very yes. happy tears. I can't tears. wait. Some more Death Dealer stuff. And his Headless Horseman. Again, oh, yeah, that's I haven't seen this one. Yeah. I think I have that issue of Heavy Metal. Oh, yeah, I definitely have it because I got it for the interview. Eternal Champion. The Tempest. Very, very, um, it's another Athon Gore against the gods again, another mm -hmm. version. Yeah, it's like the the reverse of it. Mm -hmm. And that was actually down in the corner. If you flip back real quick, this was a um, a rough work to his final death dealer that he never actually mm -hmm. got to paint um, because of because of his stroke. So that was left unfinished. It's a very interest, an interesting piece. Yeah. Of course, I, I love that um, on the next page. I love that my grandfather got to do a Bigfoot. <laughs> that is really dope. I like this guy with his top hat and a gun. I know. He's so strange. And those girls are definitely. <laughs> it those, is very those, steampunk, yeah. Yeah, and those found, I, I mean, I definitely see the inspiration of Fire and Ice in the corner there. And I think that's why Diane tied that together. Because over here, this sketch drawing of, um, it says this fierce female character. It was actually my mom. Um, my mom, my mom posed on a fire escape That's and um, <laughs> so she had a, a cameo in the movie. I, I think it was like minute 58. And then we have another drawing here in the museum too. It was the same character of the subhuman priestess and another fire and ice piece here on the left. Um, this native hunter, uh, my grandpa was giving my uncle some art lessons and, and this was done for the, for the art lesson. Warrior on Steed, another piece that's in George Lucas's collection. My God, what doesn't he have? There's a lot. He's oh, he's collected geez. a lot over the years. Well, I'm excited to see some of this once that museum opens. Me too. I'm so excited. It just feels like more collectors are starting to be like, okay, this is this is what the art's about. Let's get it out there. Let's yeah, share it with the it. world, man. You, you don't know, have to hoard yeah. it. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Don't put it in a vault or the wherever you're shipping it to. Don't just see it as an investment. See it for the world. Sorcerers. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorceress. There she is. They reference that exact one in in the comic, and then she yeah. then she puts her clothes on. But at first, she is in all her glory. So a lot of these um fire and ice sketches here, these these or the sketches, these pencil drawings of fire and ice. These were all they all appeared in the in the opening titles. Um, but it was really interesting because when I was rewatching Game of Thrones again, I think it was like two years ago, I noticed that they did pull a lot of the composition from these fire and ice drawings. Um, some of the, I can't, I can't recall the exact episode, but I'd see it and be like, oh, wow, fire and ice. There we go. Interesting. That's cool. I didn't even realize that. Up in that corner, that's Death Dealer Unmasked. So he did that um, just as a, again, it kind of, it kind of looks like all his other characters because it looks like Frank and Jack Palace. So people I definitely say, see him there in that face. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I don't know how thought through that was. I don't know if that is really death dealer, but you know, it's yeah. in the moment in time. Yep. And this came so interesting because death dealer one came in 73 and this one came in 87. So it's like what, 14 years later. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a huge gap. I just love these Death Dealer pieces. These are really cool. Look at the 
the lion, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, he loved the African tribes. I mean, his his like obsession was with the Maasai warriors. And he just said, he's like, oh yeah, Conan's cool. But like, have you seen what the actual Maasai warriors can do? Like these tribes that are so badass, you would, it would blow your mind. So he had a, a lot of um, African pieces like throughout his house and Maasai warriors to honor them. Countess. I love his, I love his pencil drawings a lot. Yeah. He loved using the pencil the most. I mean, because he said he wanted to be able to like smudge and use his fingers. It was like a, it was an experience when he was using the pencil. I've never seen this one. The knight. Yeah, I believe this one. Yes. So these were for, um, these were commissioned for L. Ron Hubbard. Now, most of my grandpa's career, he would retain the rights to the pieces and he would retain the original, but the, um, the, L. Ron Hubbard Foundation, whoever commissioned him directly, paid him so well that he was like, okay, you can have the originals and retain the rights. That's fine. Oh, wow. Oh, here we go. Here's that. Dawn Attack. Here's Dawn. Love this. Love that you guys use that for the cover to number one for the comic. Yeah, the wraparound. Yeah. I like how I liked how they did that too. I really like what I appreciate, I think, in the comics the most, like, of course, there's a lot of things, but I like the interiors, like the, the use of the interiors of the, the characters and the colors. And it's always like kind of, again, like back to a, a tribute of, of the original art. And we have a dream flight. I have a big, not the, not the original. I don't know where the original is in L. Ron Hubbard. They don't own it, but dream flight is back there. A giant canvas. I love dream flight. I feel like I saw somebody walk into the shop one time with a print of this. Probably there were um, a series of lithographs that were made. Yeah, it was massive. It was so huge, and I was like, "If I yeah. had money, dude, I'd I'd buy it." But uh, there's no way I can afford yeah. it. <laughs> I think they go for like twenty five hundred, uh, maybe maybe five thousand now. They were yeah. selling for like twenty five hundred ten years ago. And then his Moon's Rapture, originally Tarzan, and then it appeared on the Wolf Mother album cover. Yeah, I just heard about this Frazetta pillow book. I tried looking it up online, and that was really expensive on ebay they're so rare yeah, yeah. i was I like know. oh maybe i can find that and i look I'm like yep i'm gonna have to wait before i can pick that up but i think someone sent me one i have to find where it is i believe my friend topper sent me one or my friend arnie fenner they they're always supplementing me with the frazetta items that i do not have that's awesome which is very nice i'm like this sometimes from their personal collections i'm like don't do that that's so sad i feel terrible we're, oh, we're almost there awesome. i know you're crunched for time yeah, yeah. Tarzan at the Dum Dum. How far are you? I'm with Dan. I'm at Dancer from Atlanta. Four twenty one. Okay. Oh, this is dope. Really like this picture too. I remember that from one of the older Frazetta books. Beautiful. Vampirella again. Yep, he did that for the twenty fifth anniversary. There's just so much good stuff in this book. It's it's it's, it's great like a little it's it's overwhelming it's like you do have to go through it quite a few times to to experience it and then the bibliography is is great yeah see all the covers but yeah so we're we're um we're doing a uh second printing that's in the works now mm -hmm. there will be some updates some slight changes in the second edition no pressure I, i'm like i suppose up to buy another one um but I'm not sure the exact details. I just know that we're about four weeks out until that one is available because this first first printing in most places is now completely sold out. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I know. I, I the minute I saw that I could order it from work, I'm like, I put the order in. Like, it's a hefty price, but it, I mean, it's well worth every single penny. And if you don't already have one, like, make sure you're on the list for the second printing because you yeah i mean and you're a smart man ryan you got it and it's like now it's gonna it's already going up in value so that's yeah. a good a good investment don't go through it too many more times now that i've said that yeah no <laughs> this is this is the last time now that the <laughs> yeah, white on. it might be the last time for a while for sure <laughs> yeah um, yeah that's how i feel about my deluxe version right now i'm like okay you're sleeping again you're good i'm sorry won't disturb you again <laughs> well like i said before i'm so glad that you joined me to do this and i'm i always love talking with you and uh thank you for helping bring this to the world you know oh my gosh yeah it's it was it was uh um 
a battle, but it was worth it. You have to fight for things in life and you gotta, you gotta, you know, when, it, when it's worth it, it's usually a, a little bit of a struggle. So that's important to note for anyone that wants to make something happen and they see some obstacles, just go for it. It doesn't matter if you need them. If, it, if it's in your heart that you have to make it happen for the world, you have to do it. So thank you, Ryan. And I appreciate you giving me the time and, and doing this. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to love this, this, re- this review. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I hope so too, you know, and, um, like, thank you again. And I know we'll be in touch. We'll talk uh, some of the new comic stuff, but this one, I want yeah. to focus on this book. Um, yeah. Let's anybody... do that soon. Yeah. Let's do that soon. We will. And then everybody listening and okay. watching, make sure you follow Sarah. You can go to Frazetta girls and keep getting all that awesome stuff that they're doing over there. Um, the comics go to your local comic shop, make sure you put those pre-orders in and Sarah again, thank you so much. And uh, we're going to talk. Thank soon about you. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks guys so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.